and we'll be reading verses 11 through 21. Galatians 2, 11 through 21, and I will start, and then you guys can follow along as we, as we read the first half of the chapter 2. Galatians 2, excuse me, second half, 11 to 21. And the word of God says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him in, to the face, because he was not to be blamed. For before that servant came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dis- dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. When I saw that they walked on upright rightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. And it is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet that not I, Christ, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Thank you very much for the reading of God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you uh, for this day. Lord, I think there's a lot of people that might not be necessarily thanking you for this day. But I do thank you for another day that we are here, that we can hear your word, that we can be with other believers and sing and pray, and read, and study, and listen. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to bless us. Lord, that you would continue to work in our lives. Lord, yes, we are sinners, but we're sinners saved by grace, and by your grace, and your grace alone. Help us to have that desire to, because of the grace and the love with, 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 that you showed to us, Help us have that desire to live for you and show you, return that love back to you. Help us that to be the focus of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Reverence is going to lead us in singing. We would like to introduce another new song to you this evening, entitled, What a Beautiful Name. If you would please have a seat, we will sing it through one time for you. And then you can please stand and join us as we sing it again together as a congregation. First John John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We will now sing His beautiful name. Hey. 
us as we sing it again. That same Lord is above all. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.21 that Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named. Not only is this in this world, but also in that which is to come. Let us sing above all.
we should be so thankful that the same Lord shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. Let us sing together at the cross, Love Ran Red. seated and uh, good to see you tonight and we want to thank you so very much for the pleasure of your company and uh, thank you for coming out. I uh, uh, want to encourage you to read the bulletin for the events this week and beyond and uh, just one thing I do want to remind uh, you about and that is tomorrow night is the um, missions committee meeting and those of you who are on that committee please be here and then don't forget to pray for the youth outreach on Saturday night from 6 to 8 that God will use it uh, for his glory. There are other things in there that we want to encourage you all to take heed to. Men, don't forget the men's retreat coming up. We'd love to have all of you there. A great time of fellowship it'll be. The Bible conference coming up in a couple of weeks. That'll be a great time as well. And uh, just, just pray for all of those things. Now... Um, on February the 3rd, this year, coming, I will be celebrating 45 years as pastoral ministry. 
And uh, that very day was a Sunday, uh, back in 1974. And um, over those years, there's been many things I've learned, and I've often thought that I would like to put it in a book sometimes. I'd like to write a book of the funny things of the ministry, the serious things of the ministry, the stupid things I've done in ministry. That would be the biggest chapter. Um, other things. But one of the things that I have learned in ministry that relates to today uh, that I want to share with you is, is this. Why is it that, that, that Pastor Gary does not want to cancel a church service on bad weather? And, uh, you know, we found out this morning that probably every other church in town canceled themselves today. Um, I knew of a church that uh, on Thursday had planned on canceling. Uh, Friday night when I was out at the basketball game at the Blair County Christian School, we were talking to a church that planned on canceling. In fact, the pastor said to me, he says, uh, I will watch you on Sunday morning. So you know, I don't know if he watched or not. I, I will say this, that by 2 o'clock this afternoon, we had many, many, many more people who watched our Facebook site than, than would normally be the case in just a couple of hours. So, you know, God did use that. But did you ever wonder why I don't, not in favor of canceling services because of weather? There are four reasons, and, and I've learned this as a pastor for 45 years. Number one, Hebrews 9.25, 10.25, tells us not to forsake the assembling ourselves together as a matter of some is sharing this with the deacons tonight. And I said that one of the reasons why I don't like to close services because of Hebrews 9.27, that was the wrong verse. Because it says it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. That's not the reason for not canceling church. Somebody said, well, it's weather like this that you might die. I don't know, but Hebrews 10.25 says not, that we're not to forsake the assemb assembling ourselves together. You know that. I was brought up as a churchman, church boy. Church was my desire, my love. At the age of 14 at least, I don't know, maybe before that, I had a key to my home church. Uh, you know, I had people in my family who were in leadership and I would either ride my bike up to the church or my horse up to the church and just sit in that church with a key. I had the key and I didn't break in. I just sit at that church, although I did know a way to break in that back door. I think that's why they gave me the key. But um, I would just sit in that church and look at it. Just look at it. I loved it. I loved what it was, loved what it represented. In January of 1968, I surrendered to the ministry. Thought I was going to go into evangelism, but the Lord led me into the pastorate. Then in, Feb in January of 1974, you know, I was ordained. And, and I realized that that. God has called me as a pastor to do everything that I can to support and to strengthen the church. I might not always do it right, might not always do it properly, but Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. As a pastor, I've got the responsibility to see that the church functions according to the word of God. And, and that's why, number one, I, I want to keep the church open because churches can get into the habit of closing until they close permanently. And I'm not saying that's always the case, but we do know that has been the case. And, and, uh, but I have a responsibility to see that this facility is open so, uh, to, as to honor God. The second reason is there's always people who want to come to church no matter what. And, and, you know, this morning we had a great time, a good turnout. And praise the Lord. And look what we have tonight. This is a great turnout for such a cold, snowy night. And, and, and you know, if, if church wasn't opened, you folks would be disappointed. You see, so 
Therefore, as your pastor, I would have created the situation that would have been disadvantageous to your, your, your spiritual life. So there's always people that want to go to church. Thirdly, we need to encourage one another. Hebrews 10.25 tells us that we are to assemble one another together. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another, exhorting one another, and so much the more as we draw closer to the return of Christ. And so when we get together, we encourage each other. You know January and February are some of the two most depressive months of the year. When we get together with each other, we can encourage each other and help each other get through these bitter times. And then there's a fourth thing that just hit me on the way to church tonight. Out in Kansas City tonight, there's going to be a football game. People will spend how much for a seat? Probably starts at $1,000. And it's going to be anywhere from zero to six degrees. And they're not going to be in padded pews. They're not going to have a roof over the head. It'll be cold. And here's the thought that occurred to me. We should be as enthusiastic about our God as the world is about their things. We should be as enthusiastic about our God as the world is about their things. Now, you can apply that any way that you want. Okay? But... But you want to know why I am not in favor of closing down a church service? There's four reasons that I will put in my book. Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the assembly. So the pastor is responsible to see that the church is open. Number two, that there's always people who want to come to church. Make that available for those who can. Number three, we are to encourage each other. And number four, we should be as enthusiastic about our God as the world is about their things. Now, again, I... Underline everything I said there to say this. Use your wisdom and discernment. You hear me? I've said that every year. If you go out and it's bad and you have uh, two bad legs and it's nothing but ice and, and you have two bad legs and, and uh, four canes upon which you walk, I don't think it would be wise to try to go across the, 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 the ice, even if you don't have those things. Use your, use your common sense. Use your common sense. There is no, you know, there's just be sensible. But if you come, there'll be a church service here. Now, there may be other things canceled that we do from time to time. But there'll be a church service. And uh, on Facebook Live today, we got some great comments. And... Uh, we got some tremendous comments from people we don't know and from people we do know, such as Marjorie and Vicki. Thank you for those comments. And, and you know, when we, have a, when we have a service and know that we've got the capability of getting out of this building to minister to people who would like to make it and couldn't, you know, believe it or not, for a fellow who's been in the radio ministry for or in, in media ministry since every day since 1976. When I talk on the radio or on television, I can sense the people that are out there. I sense their presence. I, I do. And I, of course, I know Margie and, 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 uh, and Vicki over here. Uh, I know that, that they do watch us when, we're not, when they're not here. I know that for sure. But... Still, I, I knew it in my heart they were watching, and then they made a comment. But here's the point. We probably had the opportunity to minister to people today that we would not have had the opportunity to minister to had we not had the service. Who knows who that person is? And so, praise the Lord, and uh, those are my reasons. And, and tonight, those of you who might be watching us by live stream or YouTube or uh, Facebook Live. We're delighted that we can bring this church service to you. But may I say something to you who are watching us? Don't use the fact that we are coming to you by way of media as an excuse not to go to church. 
you know, I've heard people say, well, I can always stay home and watch. Yeah, you can, and we're glad that you can. We want you to. But Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If you have to stay home because of bad weather, if you've got to stay home because of health, all those things, praise the Lord that you don't, I mean, that's good. But don't just say, well, I don't think I'll go to church today. It's so convenient to stay here and watch. If you have to do that, do it. Thank God for it. Amen. Let me hear an amen from those of you who are here. But don't use it as an excuse. Uh, There's a big difference between watching and being involved, isn't there? Can anybody say amen to that? Yeah. Were you going to say something? Oh, okay. You tried it and it doesn't work by yourself. You tried it by yourself and it doesn't work. We need each other. So that's just the reason. And I know you didn't pay for that tonight. But thank the Lord we can deliver this service to those who need it. And what a blessing it was to hear from Margie and, and Vicki and others uh, this, today. And, um, I, you know, I say to these ladies, Margie and Vicki and Nikki and all, they are so responsive to, my, to these services. Um, they encourage me sitting down. You know, I, you, a lot of you people see the backsides of people, <laughs> back, the heads of people. <laughs> I see the front sides of people. <laughs> they're always encouraging to me, as many of you are too, but they're right up front. I can't miss them. Well, having said that, uh, it's time to take the offering. Um, the fifth reason why we don't close the church is that Baptists always need the offering. So we invite you to come forward as we give unto the work of the Lord at this time. Two handsome young men, or two handsome men. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we do thank you and praise you for the God that you are. We thank you for all that you've given to us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Lord, we thank you for an open place to come and worship Lord, there there are Christians today in various countries of this world who couldn't get to church. They would love to, but they can't meet together because they're part of the underground church. They will be persecuted if they would even try. So I thank you, Lord, for open doors. And uh, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we also have to use the media to get the word of God out to people who can't come whether it's slippery roads or illness or family, whatever the case is, I thank you that we've got this medium today. Now, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give unto you these tithes and offerings and gifts, and thank you for the way that you'll multiply the gifts and that you'll bless the giver. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you very much, Nicole and Stephanie. You know, with the number of churches that were closed this morning, I thought we'd have a bunch of preachers here this morning. Want a place to go to church? We were here, so. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, this is my story. This is my song, Praising My Savior All the Day Long. Number 393 in our hymn book, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. 393, let's stand and sing this good old song out, Blessed Assurance. tonight to pray for our missions and take this missions a moment but before I do I uh, listened to pastors four reasons for having your church opened and I, I thank our pastor that he has our spiritual welfare in such a high priority that he would be sure that the church was open if I would have been the only one here and you know that says something about the shepherd who cares that much for his flock that he had to travel the same way we do. He had to shovel snow the same as we did this morning. But what a love you have for your people, Pastor. And uh, I praise God for a pastor that looks after my spiritual well-being so much. Tonight we pray for Bethany Boston as uh, she's with Baptist Mid Missions and Bibles International and translation. And <clears throat> right now at this month, she's, she's in India. That she left on uh, January 9th, and she, uh, or January 10th, she'll be gone to April 9th. She combined her several trips so that she would just be in uh, Asia for, at one time this year. 
And right now she's in India conducting some, uh, some meetings. Uh, all the Asian workers, co-workers are meeting there for a, a workers conference. So they've gathered together and once she leaves the India, she'll be going to uh, Mylemoyer for more meetings there. So she does ask us to pray while she's gone. Uh, pray for Bethany, pray for the meetings that she's holding, pray for the fruit of her ministries, pray for her traveling mercies. You know, here's a young single lady who's gonna be gone three months in uh, strange countries. And uh, she would just really hold our prayer. Please, please pray for the Bible conference. You know, we're just uh, about eight days away from coming together and for a conference. And, you know, God can use that in a mighty way. Year after year, we seem to just hear what God does throughout that conference. So uh, make sure February 2nd, we're all occupied our seats here to hear what God has to teach us. And what a blessing we have to, to hear from the word of God. You know, on a Saturday, even just one extra day that we get some more, some more of his food. So join me in prayer now as fathers, we do come before you and, you know, as we lift up <clears throat> Bethany today, that Father, I pray that you would be very close to her for the next several months as, as she's in India this month, while they're traveling on to uh, my Lamar after that. Father, for people she comes in contact with as we are asking on our prayer request to pray for the Ranglong people there in India. The Father, that your gospel would have free course to go in and out of their lives. And Father, that as we've been so well taught here over the past couple weeks, that those that have ears, that they would hear. And Father, that it would make a difference in their life, that they would be telling the story and praising you also. Father, I, I pray that you uh, show Bethany the fruits of her ministry. Keep her in your safe care as she, as she does travel back and forth. Father, for her co-workers, that they would be one in unity, seeing that your work would be done there. Father, for the translations of the Bibles and the many languages, Father, that it would, that it would come into your being. Father, because it's your will that all could be saved and all would be saved. Father, we just leave this in your hands. And Father, I, I want to pray for the up and coming Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference. And Father, it goes through the plans, but our plans are just plans. We want to see you work. We want to do your will. Father, we want to hear from you in a very special way on that February 2nd. Oh, Father, that, that we may know you more and we may be able to tell others of the great God we have. Father, I pray that you would use that conference and take everything from the weather to the finances, put it in one package that we look back and say what great and mighty thing our God has done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Ron. Let's take our hymn books and turn to number 394. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other things are sinking sand. Solid rock, Jesus Christ. 394, let's stand and sing.
may be seated. Ms. Fowler. Thank you. Philippians 3.14 says, I press, that's a lot of work, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing is hard work. The song says higher ground. That's what I'm pressing towards. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay though some may dwell where these abound my prayer my aim is higher ground lord lift me up and let me stand my faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above this world, though Satan's darts and me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher, plant my feet on higher, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Yeah, that, that, uh, that'll sing. Well, thank you. I, I wish we had the ability to sing like her. Thank you for your encouragement. Pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Thank you very much, Val. Over the past couple of weeks, maybe months, I've been thinking of the book of Jude. And um, I've been thinking of the book of Jude simply because of the fact that the book of Jude is a book that is given to us so as to learn how to avoid apostasy. And it could very well be that in the near future, we may conduct a study on this particular book. But over the past couple of weeks, particularly, I've been focusing on the last part of the book. Now, you know that the book of Jude is large, one chapter with 25 verses. And there's a few things brought out in the last part of this book that I think it's important for us to understand, particularly in light of the fact that we are living in a day when there is great apostasy. And what I'd like to do tonight is read this book to you. And um, I'm not going to invite you to stand because it is 25 verses and uh, you can just sit there and, and enjoy the reading of it. But as we go down through it, you would see that there's a lot I could say about every verse. And if the Lord gives the opportunity to do so, if he leads, and again, we're just seeking his direction. If he gives the opportunity to do so, we will study it verse by verse sometime in the future. We've just been praying about this to see what God has. But I want tonight in the brief fashion to read the book and then to focus on those last few verses because after Jude talks about apostasy and the fact that it just creeps in amongst us, he tells us how we can avoid it in our own individual lives. And so let me read it. 
You follow along, and then we'll make a few comments there at the end, and then we'll, we'll go home. The book of Jude, the very uh, next to the last book of the, of the New Testament of the Bible, it says this. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the day, the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending, contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these things speak evil, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they are gone the way of Cain, and run greedily after the era of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are uh, without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these sayings, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to give, convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who are who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power 
both now and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that even though Jude wanted to write a book on the common salvation, you led him to write to teach us how to avoid apostasy. May we learn from this book and just the little things that we'll be talking about tonight. But we know, Lord, that with apostasy growing all around us, and that it creeps right within our midst. And if we are not careful, it creeps right within our own hearts and lives. I pray, Father, that we will always be able to stand against that which is apostasy and stand for that which is truth. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we learned when we read down through this particular book, Jude wanted to write a a book on the common salvation. And, and that would have been a blessed book. You know, we sang earlier tonight the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It's great to talk about salvation. The other day at the rescue mission, I spoke on 1 Peter chapter 1, where it talks about many of the blessings of our salvation, that we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. That is something to thank God for. And it's a blessing to write on that. To have to write on apostasy and how wicked apostasy is and how apostasy creeps in to our churches and creeps into our lives and yet we're not aware of it is not a fun book, a fun subject to write on. And yet, that's what God led Jude to write on. And it's interesting that when we read down through this particular book, we say, oh, I will never be an apostate. But it's also interesting to see what some of the descriptions of an apostate are. Murmurers, complainers, um, people who speak great swelling words, walking after their own lust, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. You know what? We may not deny Jesus Christ, but if we are murmuring and complaining, and so we are doing the work of an apostate. Pretty serious stuff to take into consideration, isn't it? This book is rich with material that, that we as Christians need to take heed to. What is apostasy? You know, I've been in discussions down through the years in conferences and so forth as to what apostasy is. And if we continue to, if the Lord leads us to go down through this book, we, we will look at some specific things. But I have written down in my Bible six statements that I've come across with regard, with regard to apostasy, what apostasy is, that I want to share with you tonight. And um, some of them are rather lengthy. Maybe if you're taking notes, and I always encourage you to take notes. That's, that's a way to learn. And, uh, you know, I, every now and then, uh, I don't know about you, but every now and then I'll, I'll come across uh, uh, Charles Stanley or David Jeremiah and, and watch their services, and, and they'll flash the camera back across the people, and people are sitting there with a notebook open and their pens and their writing. You know, that's like saying to a pastor, sick him, tiger, or whatever you want to say. Go get him. I mean, that means that people want to learn, and, 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 and it, it's a blessing to be able to watch people take notes. But uh, let me just share with you uh, these statements, and like I said, if the Lord would lead us to get out and through the study, we'd go into it in more detail. What is apostasy? These are various people. I don't recall who they are that made these statements. I would have them in my further notes, but I just have these statements written down in my Bible. Number one, apostasy is the forsaking of what one has professed or adhered to. The forsaking of what one has professed or adhered to, adhered to. For instance, if somebody for a period of time professes or recognizes that Jesus Christ is Lord and then they back off of that and deny that, they have become an apostate. Number two, 
It is a deliberate error, false teaching, a heresy, a departure from known truth. And I suppose if you're taking notes that that last phrase, a departure from known truth, would be the thing to write. But it's deliberate. It's not something that you slip or slide into. It's a deliberate error, false teaching, a heresy, a departure from known truth. It's something that is chosen to be done. Number three, somebody said it's not due to ignorance but is a willful act which involves a scornful trampling under the foot, the Son of God, desecrating His precious blood and defying the Holy Spirit. That's, that's rather lengthy. Let me give it again. It is not due to ignorance, but is a willful act which involves a scornful trampling under the foot, the Son of God desecrating his blood and defying the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's basically, in short, saying that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the blood that he shed, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit means nothing to me. Nothing at all. So I'll just go about my, my own way. Number four. Somebody says that apostasy is the exact opposite of faith. And, and that's true. Because the word apostasy would come from the Greek which says apistos. Pistos is faith. A uh, means the opposite thereof. So, you see, uh, it is the exact opposite of what true faith is in Jesus Christ. Number five. Apostasy is not a single act of sin. If somebody stumbles and falls into sin, that doesn't mean that they've become an apostate. You know, and that's good because every one of us stumble and fall into sin from time to time, don't we? And uh, if you say no to that, then you are probably apostate because you're a liar and you're going against the truth. We all do stumble and fall, but that does not mean that we become an apostate. And then finally, apostasy is a state and a condition. It's a state and a condition. It's a state of being. It's a culture. It's a way of living. And so when we read down through the book of Jude and see what these apostates are doing, as Jude would describe them, it, it really is their life. And I want to tell you, there's a lot of it that's going around in the world today. We see so much of it. You know, we're hearing, and, and of course, you all know that I'm involved with the American Pastors Network and, and that we do a radio program called Stand in the Gap, and, and uh, we hear a lot of facts and figures because of the research that we do and the guests that we have. Do you realize that there are so-called evangelical pastors today who are saying that there may be other ways to get saved and get to heaven besides Jesus Christ? Now, to those of us who are here, that's unbelievable. I mean, how could we even think that? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. How do people think that? It's simply because of the fact that they don't have the right recognition and understanding of this book, the Word of God. Everything this book says is true. There are no errors in, in this book, particularly as you trace it back to the original manuscripts. This word, that we, this Bible, this book that we hold in our hand is the Word of God. But you know something? The moment you begin to take a little bit away from the Word of God is the moment you are on your way down to acts of apostasy. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. There is only one way. And that's in Jesus Christ, who suffered and bled and died and rose again to give eternal life. But when evangelical pastors, some of them come along, well, first of all, I wouldn't consider them evangelical because they're denying truth. But they would claim to be evangelical. And that's where they deceive people. They'll stand up and say, I preach the Bible. Well, you deny there's only one way to heaven. Are you preaching the Bible? 
Obviously, they're not. I remember years ago talking to a, a pastor, and this goes to show you how you can go down the way of apostasy. I was talking to a pastor, this is years ago, this is 40 years ago. We were talking about the Bible and how the Bible is the Word of God. And, and I want you to listen to this statement. He said this, he said, I believe the fundamentals of the Bible. Is that a good thing or a bad thing to say? I believe the fundamentals of the Bible. Number one, what do you determine to be the fundamentals? The fundamentals would be that which is most significant, right? Is it not true that all this book is significant? And therefore, if you say that I believe in the fundamentals of the Bible... Well, what about those parts that you might not think are the fundamentals of the Bible? Is that, a, is that the Word of God? So you see where that kind of a thing can lead. We have pastors today who deny the eternal lake of fire. There, there is one particular pastor, I'm not going to mention his name here tonight, but... There's one particular national pastor who for years believed in the eternal lake of fire. But, but he came to the conclusion, he said, God is too kind to send anybody to hell. Well, first of all, God is more kind than you and I could ever imagine. But secondly, God sends nobody to hell. If a person goes to hell, they send themselves by rejecting Christ. God is willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you see how it is that there are those men, those pastors, those teachers who somehow get off track. And when they do, they go down the wrong road altogether. Now there's discussion amongst pastors, and probably Dr. Chris has been in these discussions can a true born-again Christian fall into apostasy? I've uh, heard that brought up at ordination councils. I've heard it brought up in pastoral di discussions that sometimes became pastoral divisions. I'm not going to answer that question tonight. But what we do find as we come to the end of this book is a solution to keep us from apostasy. And whether you think a Christian can fall into apostasy or not is not what I want to discuss at this point tonight. But it is true that a Christian can practice apostasy in certain aspects of their life. We already saw that as he goes back there and talks about the murmurers and the complainers and those types of people. That's, those are acts of the apostate. So the question is, how do we keep from practicing apostate activities? Well, look at verses 20 and 21. In fact, uh, let me go back, if, if, if I could please, to verse 20. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Let me go back to, uh, to verse um, 17. He says, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last times who walk, not after, their own, uh, who walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. Who has not the spirit of Christ? The saved or the unsaved? Okay, a little clue. Let me just go on. Verse 20. But ye, beloved, you who are Christians, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, how can we keep ourselves from apostate activities? From living the apostate? from inviting concepts of apostasy into our lives. How can we prevent that? 
Well, there are four things right here that I bring up to you, simple things. You know, this is the thing about the Word of God. Living the Christian life is not complicated. If we try to do it ourselves, it is. But we have a book here that tells us how to do it. If we just obey, we can do it. I've often heard people say, living the Christian life is a hard thing to do. Sure, if we try to do it in ourselves. And by the way, trying to live the Christian life by our own strength is what we call legalism. That is trying to perfect the things of the Spirit through the works of the flesh. The book of Galatians is written about, about that. And he says, in, Paul says in Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit and ye shall what? Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But when we walk in the Spirit, we'll see the fruit of that Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no, no law. And so you see, here's the point. If we endeavor to, to live the Christian life on our own, it is difficult. But if we obey the Word of God and allow the Spirit of God to do the work, though it's discipline, the Christian life is a disciplined life. Though it's disciplined, when we allow the Spirit of God to do the work, the victory is ours. So we've got four simple things here. Four simple points from the Word of God as to how to avoid apostate actions within our lives. The first one is we are to be building. Look at verse 20. He says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. We are to be building ourselves up in the things of the Lord. Um, you know, we need to understand that our foundation is whom? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 tells us that. But as Christians, though our foundation is Christ, which means that it's, we sang that, that on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Christ is the foundation upon which the whole church is built. It's the foundation upon which your life and my life stands. If we're not on that foundation, we will sink. If we are on that foundation, we will stand no matter what. So Christ is the foundation upon which we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. But on that foundation upon which we stand as Christians, we are to build ourselves up in the faith. How do we do that? Well, keep your finger there in the book of Jude and go back to the book of Acts, chapter 20. You know, I've also been praying about a series on the book of Acts. In, in, in case you're worried, I've been in the pastoral ministry almost 45 years. In case you worry, you're worried, I've not run out of material yet. And don't expect that I will because there's so much in this word. We, Dad and I, Mom and I, know a fellow, the pastor, who had to change churches every four years because he ran out of sermons. I, I, I don't understand that. Uh, it'd take me four years to go through a couple of verses if I'd really give it the time. Somebody asked me one day, why do you have so many series of messages? Can I give you a clue? A lot of the series of messages I have don't start out to be series. It's just that there's so much to bring out so that we might grow in Christ. But go back to Acts chapter 20. And in, in, in the book of the Acts has a lot to say about our Christian growth and development, particularly as it relates to the local church. But look, if you would please, at Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, where Paul is speaking here. And, and uh, keep in mind that he uh, was charging uh, the, the elders there at Ephesus. And he was on his way to, to Jerusalem. And in verse 32, he says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to what? Build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Wow. How do we build ourselves up? By the word of grace. That is the what? Word of God. The Bible. The more we are in the Word of God, the more the Word of God will build us up so that we can 
not only be the Christian that we ought to be and God wants us to be, but we will be able to avoid apostasy. So I ask you a question tonight. How is your Bible study? How is your, how is your Bible reading? How is your Bible living? It's the Word of God that will build us up so that we won't involve ourselves in acts of apostasy. Young people, we have a lot of young people here tonight for a cold, icy night. It's probably because many of us who are a little older are a little hesitant in going out. And I think we probably do have the oldest man in our congregation here tonight, don't we, Dad? I, re- I remember when the oldest man in the congregation was Al Ebersol, but he's dead. We keep going up, don't we? But young people, good group of you here tonight. And that, to me anymore, is anywhere under 60. Uh, no, it, you know, not, I would say 20 and below. Maybe even 40 and below. Who knows? The older you get, the, the, the older the young people are. Young people. And you young people that might be watching, make sure you're in the word of God. It'll keep you from apostasy. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It'll keep you from apostasy. And don't just read and study the Bible academically, but read it spiritually with the intent of learning more about God and who he is and what he expects and how he operates. Build yourself up in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. The second way to avoid apostasy is in verse 20, where he says, praying in the Holy Ghost. We are to pray. How is your prayer life? You know, we have just gone through what I believe to be the most enjoyable, significant, and hopefully the most effective week of prayer we've ever had. The best attendance the best response, the greatest prayers that I've heard by people. I mean, it's just, it was a blessing to me to be involved. And we were told to pray. But here he says something interesting. He says, don't just pray, but pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, I think a week or so ago, I gave a message on Sunday night with regard to what it means to pray in the Holy Ghost. So I'm not going to elaborate too much on it tonight, but to pray in the Spirit simply means to allow the Spirit of God to lead us in our prayers. And what does that involve? Well, it involves, number one, realizing that we don't know how to pray for what we ought. And so when we go to prayer, we should, first of all, Uh, base our prayer time in the Word of God. And then as we go to prayer, we should ask the Lord to lead us through the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's true that when our heart is right, that by the time our prayer gets to heaven, it's what it ought to be. And remember, we were told the other week, we learned the other week, we're not to pray to the Spirit, but we pray to God through the Spirit. But if we are going to pray in the Spirit, we need to... First of all, make sure that we recognize how we come into God's presence. And that's through the name of Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you would, please, back to John chapter 16 and verse 23. And so you see, to pray in the Spirit means to allow the Spirit of God to lead us to depend upon the Spirit, to intercede for us. By the time our prayers get to heaven, they will be what God wants them to be according to His will. But it's important that we realize that it's not through our goodness that we can come into the throne of grace. It's because of what Christ did for us. Uh, John 16 and verse 23. Jesus says, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Talking about the time when We're all gathered together with the Lord and so forth. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father, what are those next three words? In my name, he will give it. Don't ever, ever, ever attempt to pray apart from the name of Jesus. And and a simple way to remind ourselves of that is maybe... 
to begin the prayer in Jesus' name, Father, I come to you. But for sure to end it by saying, in Jesus' name we pray. You see, praying in the name of Jesus reminds us of the authority that we have to come before God. And because Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, we have the authority to come before Him. And when we are recognizing that it's in the name of Jesus that we are coming before God, that same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave is the Holy Spirit who will lead us in our prayer life to the point that by the time our prayers get to heaven, they are what God would want them to be. Pray in the Spirit, recognizing that we're coming to God through the work of Christ and under the direction of the Spirit of God. Keeps us from apostasy. How is your prayer life? We could stop right there, couldn't we? fact of the matter is, if we're not in the Word of God and if we don't have an active prayer life, we may already be on our way to apostasy as far as practice is concerned at least. Number three, verse 21. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, how, what in the world does that mean? The Bible says God has loved us with an everlasting love. Right? Jeremiah 31.3. The Bible says nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? That's in Romans chapter 8, the end. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, those are all verses that talk about the love of God. How then do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Certainly it's a personal responsibility. It's the responsibility that God has given us. Not only that, but it's, it's, it's a place of obedience because we're to do it. But how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Now go back to John 15, 14. John 14 and verse 15. John 14 and verse 15. Jesus, again, this is the same context, basically, that we looked at a little bit ago there in John 16. It's the Olivet Discourse. But in John chapter 14 and in verse 15, we see these words. Jesus says, if you love, I'm sorry, verse 15 of John 14, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Keeping ourselves in the love of God meaning, means obeying his word. You see how these three go together? How do we build ourselves up in the Word of God? We're to pray. How do we pray? By the Spirit of God leading us. We must be in the Word. We must be praying. And when we are in the Word and when we are praying, then we are to obey the Word of God. And by obeying the Word of God, that keeps us in the love of God because everything that God tells us to do in this, His Word, He loves, right? Would God tell us to do anything He doesn't love? No. So even the most difficult things that we think are part of the Christian life, we should do because we're doing that which God loves and we are keeping ourselves in the circle of God's love as a Christian. And doing that through obedience will keep us from acts of apostasy. Number one, are you in the word of God? Number two, are you praying in the spirit? Number three, are you keeping yourselves in the love of God? And then number four, we are to look. He says, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. <laughs> and that means looking for the return, looking for the rapture. talks about mercy, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus. I was thinking about that the other day. The greatest act of God's mercy is when Christ died on the cross. And I think the next greatest, and it's right up there with it, the next greatest act of God's mercy is when Jesus comes for us. 
to take us out of this world and to take us into his presence. And then when you take into consideration what's going to happen after we are raptured, the, the earth's going to really go to hell, as it were, because all hell is going to break forth out on the earth. You understand that the Great Tribulation period, a time of seven years, when God's wrath will be poured out on the earth like never before. Thank God, as Christians, we won't go through that. You know what? I wish I had time to preach three hours in the next two minutes. This is one of the areas where I think a lot of people are getting off track. Used to be that by and large, fundamental evangelical people believed in the pre-tribulation rapture. But today, I don't know how many people you run into are questioning it. Well, maybe we will go through the wrath of God. You know, maybe we will go through the tribulation. Folks, I will stand here tonight and I will stake my life on it. There's no way we can enter it. No way. How do I know that? Not not just because I don't want to go there. But I know it because of the work of Christ. And because the fact that Jesus Christ has delivered us from all of the wrath of God, including eternal hell, including the great tribulation period, which is a time in which God's wrath will be poured out upon the earth through the devil. Listen, you and I won't spend one second in the tribulation period. We can't. Don't try to debate it. Boy, I can break this pulpit. But this makes me angry. It makes me angry. One of the reasons that brings apostasy is treading under the foot the blood of Jesus Christ. We read that in that book, did we not? If I come along and say, we might go through the tribulation period, we ought to be kicked. We can't do it. Why? Jesus has already died for us. We can't touch it. For the sake of Almighty God, believe your Bible. You say, you better give me some proof, Gary. I can do that. Can I borrow a minute off of you? Turn to 1 Thessalonians. You know, I could really get worked up on this. You think I have? No, I haven't. You haven't seen the half of it. This angers me. Every, every chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians ends with some reference to the second coming of Christ. But notice in 1, uh, second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. I'll go back to verse 9. It says, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how that you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait, say that with me, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Folks, we're already delivered. We all were already delivered from it. And, and, you know, if we were to speak of this from the Greek text, the point of the fact is Jesus Christ has already delivered us from the wrath to come and continues to deliver us from the wrath to come. There's no way we can get into that wrath to come. Believe the Bible, for goodness sakes. O.T. Ellis, a great amillennialist, once said, If I would take the Bible literally, I'd have to be a pre-tribulation guy. Duh! Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Well, why would we go into it then? We don't. We can't. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I really think that some people who think that you can get it, you'll go into the tribulation as a Christian. Listen, they've got too much time on their hands, sitting around and thinking about dumb things. 
Well, my time's up. Go back to verse 21 of Jude 1. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Let's anticipate the return of Christ because, and I wish I had time to develop this a whole Titus 2.13 says that we are to be looking for the glorious, we are to be looking for the blessed hope. That's the rapture and the glorious appearing. That's the second coming of Christ to the earth after the tribulation period. But we are to be looking for the blessed hope. It could come tonight. And the reason why we should look forward to it is because we'll go to be with Jesus, but also because of what 1 John chapter four verses one through, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 teach us, and that is that when we see him, we will be like him. That means a lot. No sin and no rheumatoid arthritis either. The best is yet to come. So you see, being focused on the rapture, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life is one of the keys to enable us to avoid apostasy. Now listen, we're done. If we in any way, shape, or form do not build ourselves up in the Word of God, if we in any way, shape, or form do not have an active prayer life, if we in any way, shape, or form do not keep us ourselves in the love of God, and if we forget to look forward and anticipate the rapture, then we are opening the door to apostate actions in our life. And any activity of an apostate is not pleasing unto God for the Christian. So, take heed of these four things. I read them again. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You know it doesn't stop there. Notice the challenge he gives us in verse 22. He says, And of some have compassion, making the difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. What's that telling us? It says we're to work to keep people out of apostasy. And some people you work with in a kind way. Come on now. Come on. Come here. Let me help you. There's others. You put the fear of God in them. But praise the Lord for verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Falling where? Out of salvation? Well, no, maybe in the long run, perhaps, but from falling into apostasy. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look into your word. Take it and apply it to our lives tonight. In Jesus' name we